Hey, welcome everyone. Today, we are talking wiring diagrams. How do you use them? How do you read them? How do you translate it out? Because really guys, that's what we're doing. We're having to translate out what the engineer drew up using symbols and lines and letters and whatever else they decide to put in there. We have to translate it out into something that we understand. Because guys, I remember the first time I saw a wiring diagram, it was like trying to read hieroglyphics. I mean, it's it can be a daunting process. Some diagrams can be very simple. Some can be very complex. And it doesn't correlate directly to vehicle year or options or anything like that. An old vehicle can have a very complex circuitry, a new vehicle very basic. It all depends on the way the architecture of that circuit was designed. But today, and through this multi-part series, guys, we are going to be getting into wiring diagrams from the most basic of simplicity today all the way up through future um, future videos on this where we get to the very complex and then we're going to begin to throw in their faults and that kind of thing so that you guys have a way to to understand how we can take a diagram and use it to become a very very efficient person at diagnosing electrical concerns because without a diagram you are shooting blind at that vehicle you're performing tests that you have no idea what the data is the results are going to be a diagram when read and used properly can save you a ton of time. Um, it just makes sense to use a diagram. And, and really guys, this video is a follow-up to a, a video that I had done a couple weeks ago where I used a diagram in there and I was able to use process of, process of elimination uh, within that diagram based upon the fault that I was experiencing. Therefore, I didn't have to go and test every single aspect of the circuit. It saved time by taking the time with the diagram, okay? That's what we're gonna be able to get into today. But before we actually look at a diagram, I'm gonna go ahead and get some, uh, we'll call them rules of thumb out of the way that we can apply to most, if not all diagrams, whether they're domestic, Asian, European, whatever they might be. Rule number one, a diagram is written in a rest state. This is almost always the case. I'm sure there's one out there that may not be, but a rest state, meaning the switch isn't turned on, the key isn't on, it's not energized. Whatever situation that the control would be functioning in that circuit, it's currently not being uh, pushed or pressed or activated, whatever it might be. Rest state, key off, engine off, vehicle sitting by itself, nothing happening. All right, rule number two, and this one's a little bit more informational. Uh, in terms of getting access to a wiring diagram, typically you will have to pay for access, whether that's through the OEMs, through their resources, or an aftermarket data supplier like Alldata, Mitchell, uh, Identifix, those types of resources. Typically, you will have to pay to gain access to it. And you may find something out there in a forum or out on Google or something like that, but typically wiring diagrams are a pay-to-play type of resource that we use. Our third rule, commonly when you find a diagram, you will see that you will have power displayed at the top of the diagram and ground from the bottom. Rule number four, with power being at the top, ground being at the bottom, those sources, the power source or the ground source, will stop at the first open circuit. And then rule number five is more of just a best practice. When you first initially look at a diagram, find your load in the circuit or the component that you're trying to diagnose for failure. And then from there, figure out where um, the other major components are within that circuit. You know, what's controlling it, where's the fuse, relay, that type of thing. And then from there, go ahead and begin tracing the diagram out using different colors. And that leads me to the um, article that was written by George Menchu. Uh, there's a link down here below, but he talks about kind of standardizing the color coding for a diagram. So we're gonna follow suit with that today. It's a great article, go ahead and read it if you're, if you're interested. But he uses red for power, green for ground, and those are all the time. Anytime that in the rest state there's power, it's gonna be red, anytime we're in the rest state, and it's grounded, it's going to be green. And then we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna use yellow for a switched ground, meaning it only applies ground when a switch is turned on or some sort of switch is turned on. And then he uses orange for a switched power. Unfortunately, through this guy here, I don't have orange. So we're gonna be substituting orange out with blue today. Blue is going to be our switched power, okay? So I think now that we have those kind of rules out of the way, let's go ahead and take a look at our first diagram. All right, so this is a relatively simplistic horn circuit for a 2008 Chevy Impala. Nothing too crazy here, but let's go ahead and just start breaking it down like I had talked about. 
All right, so we'll start off by locating our load in the circuit. What's consuming the power? What is the point of this diagram? And that is the horn assembly. This is the guy that we're looking for. This is the guy that we're most likely diagnosing in the event of a fault. That is our horn assembly. This is our main focus. Now let's go ahead and find our other major components. We'll start over here with our horn switch. This is how we're going to go ahead and control our horn by turning the switch on and off or by basically pressing on the steering wheel. If we continue up from there, we have the inflatable restraint steering wheel module coil, which is a fancy word for the clock spring. We're gonna continue over to here. We have the body control module involved. Um, body control module is likely involved for uh, security type of things. So when we lock the door, we go ahead and activate the horn to confirm that it's locked or in the event of an anti-theft, uh, somebody trying to break in, the BCM may control the horn to turn on to deter that theft. Uh, we continue up through the diagram and we have um, wiring flowing here. We have the fuse box under the hood and we have B plus labeled out here telling us that this thing is fed power at all times. So those are the major components within our diagram. Now let's go ahead and start applying our colors to it. So we'll start with our power, what's hot at all times. We're feeding our battery. So anytime our battery is connected, which it is at rest, we're gonna go and apply power here, here, and then through to there. Now that's not the only thing. The battery's job is not to only supply the horn relay at this point, okay? Even though that's what it looks like in this diagram, that's not the case. The reason we know that is because of this dotted line box right here. The dotted line box, for those of us that have popped the hood and taken a fuse box cover off, we know that there's not just one relay under there, right? That dotted box tells us that there's more information to be had here than what's currently being given to us. Any dotted line box, it's not the entire story, okay? That is not the only wires going into the fuse box. Our horn assembly surrounded with a solid line box, that is all that's involved with that component right there. Our horn switch must have some sort of other circuitry involved. Our clock spring, some sort of other wires or circuitry involved. Our BCM obviously does more than just control the horn in the event of an anti-theft function. Um, so dotted line, there's more to the story. Solid line, that's telling us everything in there. Okay, so our power flows down and it stops, like I said, at an open circuit. So right here, our circuit is open. And right here, we actually have a small load. So this guy right here is a coil of windings inside of our relay. What it basically does is when supplied with power and ground, it's gonna create this, this small magnetic field and we're gonna actually pull this relay contact closed right here. When we do that, we supply power down to our horn, okay? That's what our relay is doing. So we do have a small load inside of there. All right, so our power has stopped there. Let's go ahead and draw out what is grounded at all times. G100, G102, are both grounded at all times, like so. But those are not the only two grounded at all times points. We also have this guy right here. So our solid ground right there within the BCM itself. So that's what's gonna be grounded anytime we are um, not functioning within the circuit. Now let's go ahead and draw our switched ground. So that's gonna be yellow. We'll start here at our horn switch. It's gonna travel up through our clock spring and it's gonna stop right here. Right here we have this little dot. That little dot is a splice or a junction within the wiring, meaning that our ground here splits. So we go this way to our BCM for a switch and then we travel up here to this little diamond. This little diamond is a fork in the road. If we have RPO option package 6J4, we go this way. If we don't, we go this way, that's simple. If we have 6J4, we actually go through a connector here, X266. Um, if we don't have 6J4, we have no connector. And then we keep traveling up here into the bottom side of our relay. And that's gonna be how that functions. So we basically end up with most of our circuit being switched ground. That switched ground, when we turn our horn switch on, we will allow that switched ground to turn this relay on right here, basically ignite this or uh, energize this little coil of wires. And then like I said, that's gonna pull that little switch over inside of the relay and give us our switched power to horn 
fuse, uh, to the horn fuse, which is a 15 amp fuse. It's gonna travel down and into our horn assembly and apply those both horns with power. And actually, we'll fix the ground here because they're technically supplied ground to each. When we supply our horns with power through our switched ground here, when we supply them with power, it's grounded all the time, our horns should make noise, they should beep, right? Makes sense. So we're actually using a ground side control here, this entire circuit is our control circuit to energize a small little coil of windings inside of our relay to pull over this little switch to send power down to our horn to make it go off, it's that simple. By drawing a diagram out like this, we're really able to see what it looks like as a whole, what it's doing, how, how it functions, how we can begin to diagnose the circuit in the, uh, in the event of a failure. It really makes for uh, a streamlined diagnostic process because now we should know what to test and where, and we'll get into what that all is in the next lessons. But basically, this is a good starting point because if you don't have this aspect down, if you don't know where there's power at all times and ground at all times and where things are switched and that kind of thing, there's really no sense in getting out your test slide or your DVOM or even your lab scope. There's no point in performing a test unless you have an idea of what it is that you're testing and what to expect as a result. Otherwise, you're basically testing and collecting data for, uh, for nothing. You, it, there's no point to it, right? Lay out your diagram, figure out where your powers and grounds and switched powers and grounds are. That gives you the ability to tackle this thing very, very, very efficiently. And we'll get into the faults and that kind of thing in upcoming classes. So if you guys enjoyed this today, please give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, click on that little bell icon, that way you get a notification next time we publish a video, that way you can get notified when we come out with part two of our wiring diagram series. I really, really appreciate you guys being there, thank you for that, and as always guys, happy wrenching, thank you.